Um, I think maybe give a couple of minutes, but I'll pass over to to Nina, who, as I understand it, will be introducing uh, Charlie Azaki next week. So over to you, Nina. Okay, thank you. So West Mill Solar members have been talking about sustainable buildings for a few years now. With one of our AGMs, we, we had a lot of conversations along the lines of how come these buildings that are planned or being built near where I live aren't zero carbon or low carbon and sustainable? And it got a bit of momentum. So at one of the AGMs, we decided we wanted to do something on um, particularly sustainable homes and sustainable construction. So you'll hear a bit about community funding, but uh, one of the things we've done is been looking around for good examples. And I'm absolutely delighted that we've got Charlie Luxton as our keynote speaker today, because he is a champion of sustainable buildings. So he runs a successful architect's practice in Oxfordshire, Charlie Luxton Design. And like I say, he's a champion of sustainable building to the extent that he's out there getting the message out. He's an author, he's published books, he's a TV presenter. And what he's going to tell us about today is a really inspiring example of um, community-led, low-carbon, sustainable housing that's been going on in Hook Norton. So yeah, sit back and enjoy, and there will be a, a, an opportunity for some questions and answers at the end. And feel free to put comments in the chat as we're going, someone's watching that. So hopefully Charlie has the power to sort out his slides and, and um, show us his interesting story. Hello, I'm just gonna put you on um, full screen and then we'll get going. How's that? Can you see that? Yes, that's all good, Charlie. Great, okay. Hello everybody and um, welcome. I hope your AGM is going well. Um, so I wanna to talk to you about community-led housing. And I think my sort of take on community-led housing and part of the reason why the housing that we're getting is not sustainable and not the housing that we want comes down to fairness. And I think you might say, well, you know, I think the government and large developers would argue that the housing that we're building is the housing that we want because it sells. But there was a survey a few years ago by Reba and um, NAXPA, the National Association of Custom and Self-Build, and that found that 74% of people um, would not buy a new home. Now, that is, that is an abject failure of, a, of an industry if they are creating a a product that basically nobody wants. So, you know, I think there's there's many reasons behind that around land ownership and the way in which the system um, maximizes value to the landowner. And because there is a, a squeeze on supply um, can produce a very substandard product and it will still sell. But I think there's also a, a sort of a, 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 another issue that we are tacitly involved in, and that is to do with the fact that we've not really engaged in the building process, I think, over the last 40 years of uh, the delivery of new housing. I think there's been a, a, a sort of a, a wide agreement between state and people that we're not really into new housing, certainly not in the countryside, so we want to sort of ignore it, push it away. I do accept that has changed more recently, but as a result, the new housing that we're delivering has become really incredibly unfair because we're not engaging with it and making that process one that is reciprocal. It is a, it is a completely um, one of, of, of um, conflict in many ways where uh, somebody wants to build housing, everyone objects, no one has a conversation about what the housing could look like. Eventually the planners and the, the state decide they can build them and then these houses are sort of dumped there. And there's only ever a conversation about yes and no and never a conversation about what you know what and i think as a result that, that what we're building is very unfair um so if you, you live in village i live in Norton, and this directly out of our experience in hook norton which was that we've had 160 new houses uh built in the village and they have been sort of built against the village's wishes in many cases and that's not because the village said we don't want housing actually our, our local plan said we do want housing we're fine with housing we'd like bunches of sort of 25 houses here and there in phases to give them a chance to assimilate and, and you know and build up slowly 
And um, immediately we got 70 houses from Taylor Wimpy and that was approved against the council and against the planning appeal at Secretary of State level and right rush shot over our, over our neighborhood plan. Um, so, so I think that you would expect a lot of people in the village to be very battered and bruised by that and say, we don't want any housing. Well, parallel to this going on in our village, there is a low carbon group called Hook Norton Low Carbon and we have done many things such as solar panels and the car club and um, solar hot water on the, on the, on the um, school and uh, a, a, a pig club, a growing club and various other things around the community and, and a rolling refurbishment fund where we've lent money to about 60 to 70 houses to do sustainable improvements to their homes at, at zero or no interest, at zero or very low interest. And we got to a point where we were saying, well, what, what do you, the community, want us to do next? And we asked everyone in the village. And actually about, I think it was like 60% or something, I can't quite remember the exact thing, it was an incredibly high number, said housing. We want you to look at housing, but we want you to look at the right kind of housing that we as a community are interested in and want and is sustainable and is for local people with need. Which is extraordinary given the kind of bloody uh, and bruised a state that I think the community felt in, you know, as, as house number 150 was sort of being finished. Well, so um, we then identified as a community, a um, small piece of, piece of land. Sorry, my screen is not letting me move on. I don't know why. There we go. We identified a small piece of land in our village, which you can see there in red, which was actually owned by Cherwell County Council. And it was a sort of piece of land left over from a 1950s development, uh, sort of backland here uh, between the Sports and Social Club. This is the new Taylor Wimpy estate here and uh, the 1950s development here. And what, what happened when the Taylor Wimpy scheme went through is working with Cherwell Council, um, we managed to get into the planning this little access road here i don't know if you can see that where the number two is um that meant that there was access from the new development into this piece of land with a future sort of provision that it could be built on and we um approached churwell having sort of uh, got this access secured during the planning process about doing a community-led housing project and we approached Taylor Wimpy about accessing across their land where they had a, a predictably had a ransom strip. And actually, you know, with, with all due respect to Taylor Wimpy, they said, if it is a community led project, we will give it to you at just the cost of legal fees, which was incredibly good of them in many ways. I mean, yeah, I mean, there's many other things you can say about Taylor Wimpy, but that was a very, very good, you know, very fair action. So we sort of were in a good position. We had a piece of land to look at and it, it had a lot of constraints actually. It had a very kind of circuitous access through the new housing estate. It uh, is right next to the mugger, the multi-use games area. So there's a lot of noise coming from that. It is, you know, it's right behind, you know, the residents of Hook Norton's uh, housing. And so obviously where they've had a, a little kind of bit of wildness, if you like, a, a kind of an area of land that's been partly allotment, partly sort of informal use land and, and actually a little bit of sort of a little wildlife haven, which obviously has downside to build on. You know, they, they were going to get housing that changes things quite a lot. But the key thing that we, we found is that, that, you know, if you start talking to people and explaining why this housing is going, what this housing is for, and that it's going to be for, for local people, um, most of it affordable, some of it very affordable, some at market to cross subsidize the affordable, and that it's going to be very sustainable. And then we're going to try and build community facilities within it. People people's attitude changes and I think it comes back to that first point of fairness that when there is a reasonable transaction between the change that is going to happen and that there is some upside to change and downside people are much more likely to be supportive of it whereas if you are getting a, a new housing estate of 30 houses on your village and it's just going to be more traffic more pressure on the school more pressure on the services more pressure on the broadband more pressure on the on, on the school uh, sorry, the, 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 the doctor's surgery, then yeah, know what? People aren't interested. But if it's otherwise, they are. And I think there's another side to that, which is that of the 140 houses that were built in our community, I work in the construction industry. I don't know a single person that worked on any of those constructions who laid a single brick or tile or anything, uh, which is extraordinary. So 
unfortunately, all the money that was sort of made, if you like, in that community, left the community in a white van down the M40 or in a you know, Mercedes down to the city of London for the investors. And one person got millions for the land. And it's just a really unfair situation that means that no one's up for it because we're all about fairness. So having sort of identified a piece of land and looked at the housing that was built, we sort of started also by looking at, at Hook Norton and trying to understand what our village is and how it works. And it has a sort of density to it. It has some very iconic buildings. It has a, a sort of an urban grain, if you bear with me, the sort of architecture chat for a while about the, what the size of buildings, the proximity of buildings, shared spaces, um, that none of these new houses follow. And all the new housing that we get in this country is effectively the same, born out of 1980s, 1990s, suburban sort of um, landscaping ideas, driven by the car fundamentally. Um, and then they'll just put some ironstone on the outside of it if it's here, or they'll put some timber clouding of it on it if it's in Suffolk. And unfortunately that does not make it sort of sensitive to location. So one, that's a very important point, I think for us and the community is that people were saying, we kind of want this housing to look like it belongs here, that it's part of Hook Norton, which I think is a, a really interesting sort of side point. So we sort of had some land, um, potentially, and we had an idea uh, about some new housing, but we didn't know what that housing should look like, and we didn't know what it should include, and we didn't really know that people were going to support it. And so we engaged in a genuine community consultation process. It started in, as you can see, February 2018. And we then continued through a long and sort of involved community consultation process, working with the Low Carbon Hub, who helped us get grant uh, funding and Ox Futures. And we um, asked many different kinds of questions about, would you like housing? What should that housing look like? You know, what does hooky mean to you? Um, and what's the dream? What are the ideal things you'd like to have in a community housing project? And, and also what could go wrong? So we started engaging, you know, those kind of conversations. And many of the things that came out of that were people really clearly wanting mixed age, mixed age groups living side by side. So not the, the kind of like the, the sort of, and, and I say this without meaning to be a derogatory, but the sort of ghettoization that you get in many of the new housing estates because they are providing one kind of housing and therefore they tend to get a certain type of kind of community moving into those. And I think what is kind of interesting is how do we really mix up the kind of people that live in new housing um, so that it reflects the existing socioeconomic and age profile of a community. Now that's not to say communities need to stay still, but I think that we are radically altering our smaller village communities, uh, certainly in this part of the world, with large scale developments of three, four bedroom housing of a certain, detached housing of a certain type, you know, and that, 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 that is, I think, I think clear to say, and I'm not sure that anyone's really talking about that. What's interesting if you talk to people in the community, they sort of do talk about that in a slightly oblique way. But they also wanted sustainable houses with low running costs and it yet to reflect and relate to the existing architecture of Norton and definitely to provide smaller affordable housing that crucially would go to people in the local community rather than um, the wider Cherwell Oxford community. And I think that, you know, that there's definitely a place for that. But, you know, of the affordable housing that is built in this village with 160 houses, probably 20 affordable housing, ours sort of, you know, from conversation, very few of those have actually been taken up by uh, Hook Norton residents. That's my understanding. So there was a real want for local need to take priority, uh, which is something we, we, we certainly have tried to, to work with. We carried on with another series of, 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 of consultations. Uh, with another much more detailed survey which, to provide housing needs. So we could go back to Cherwell and say, this is the need in the community. We have clearly got affordable need. We can then use your land to try and answer that need because um, councils have a requirement to, 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 to respond and reflect and, and answer the need for affordable housing. Now, what's very interesting when you start doing housing needs surveys and, and, and the council will say, well, look, 
look how many people are on the housing list that are from the local area. They, I think there was, uh, and these figures might be wrong, but they're plus or minus a few, you know, a few, a few points there. They're right. About seven or eight people in the local community were on the housing um, list. And what we found out is that the combined household income to get on the housing list is actually about 70 or 80,000 pounds. And actually then when you go back to people and say, look, you're, are you earning less than, I think it actually is 80,000 pounds for a combined household income. Do you want to go on the housing list? People are like, no, I don't really want to go on the housing list. I don't need to be on the housing list. I'm earning, you know, I don't feel that's, I want to be on the housing list. So we had a whole long conversation with, with Cherwell County Council about the fact that there were people that clearly could be on their housing list, but weren't really wanting to be on their housing list, which actually became more and more of an issue as the project developed and became more real because Cherwell was sort of saying, well, these people need to be on our housing list in order for you to justify them going into the housing and for us to be answering our housing list. And, and so we've had to do a lot of work with how we constructed a series of constraints that or, or requirements to go on our, our sort of on our affordable housing list, which mirrors theirs without them going on the housing list. It all got very complicated, but it's kind of interesting how these little sort of social um, kind of issues that you really wouldn't necessarily expect to be there are there. And when you speak to the housing officers at Cherwell, you know, and you say, but these people could be on the housing list, but they don't want to be on the housing list. And they're like, well, why don't they just go on the housing list? The housing list is fine, let's go on the housing list. And there's a complete lack of sort of, it's almost like you're speaking a different language, which is slightly sort of confusing. So having gone out with a much more detailed um, sort of list of the kind of people that we wanted to speak, uh, the, the kind of requirements we need, 37 people said they really wanted to be on a, on, a, on a list and they were interested in the housing. And we started working specifically with what we called the 37. Uh, the 37 changed, it went up and down a little bit, you know, a few people left, one or two, and a few people joined, but it's sort of, we still call it sort of in one way, the 37. It's almost like our wider board. Um, and we also created a community land trust, which is Hook Norton Community Land Trust. And the project sort of started to coalesce around an idea of Homes for Hooky. And so we started asking many questions about what people might want to be there, what was important to them. And actually that rolled on into um, delivering and showing specific proposals for how these houses might look and be arranged. And, and this is where it gets kind of interesting because we went to the community with three options. This is actually a second iteration of, of, of sort of massing conversation or master plan conversation. And the first options, um, which uh, we're actually in this session here, and I, annoyingly I don't have those images, I apologize. Actually, you can see us looking at the bottom left there, we're actually talking about them, was we asked people, what do you want? Now, clearly developers build little uh, houses with small gardens all around them. And they, are, they have a little place to park your car and they have a little bit of garden on all sides and they are standalone and nominally an Englishman's home in his castle. And apparently that is what we want because clearly that is what they build. And actually, when you talk to people, you know, you ask them, is this really what you want? Or would you like to have the houses more densely clustered together? Would you like to put the cars in parking yards away from the main site so the cars don't dominate the landscape? Now, part of you thinks surely they're going to go for the latter, but part of you worries that they're going to go for the former and you just sort of hold your cross your fingers and, and, and ask. And the answers were overwhelmingly, we are happy to have the cars parked away from the houses. So we have to walk to our front door a little way. Um, but if that means we can have more community shared space in the heart of the build, in the heart of the shop, uh, site, then we're, 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 we're up for that. That sounds great. And, and, and actually that's hugely um, reassuring and, and affirmative, uh, you know, affirmative. We also ask questions about, you know, design, about roof shapes, about identity, about uh, how these buildings could look and finish. And it, and it took a very long time until January 2020 when we'd sort of engineered a, a scheme and designed a scheme and we had a sort of a wider and we'd had a pre-app and we'd done all of those things with um, and we sort of had a bigger right before we go to planning we want you know everyone come down and look at this proposal and before we sort of really just do the last push and get final kind of input onto how it should work and it was an incredibly successful experience we had I don't know 150 people came during the course of five hours. People from the Community Land Trust were there. 
we were there and it was a really amazing and interesting experience with with virtually no negative comments i mean obviously a few people were like well they're right at my back garden but interestingly enough even the people that lived around the houses and were going to be you know impacted by it more than anyone else over time through conversation and listening to their concerns and slightly altering the design they came on board and didn't object and and that to me is amazing and actually one of the people who's adjacent to the site has is going to sell us and we've got an option on a piece of their land which allows us to build four market value housing to sort of cross subsidize the affordable housing and he's selling it to us to that at very much below market rate and you just think you know people are good you know when it is fair and equitable and and, and a collective decision people are genuinely good um and we also did this um this, this process of, of documenting the conversation uh, to try and sort of understand all the things that we were trying to sort of collect into the building and understand what people wanted from the house, which I think is a really lovely uh, graphic that sort of helps us kind of we do look, go back and look at and, and remember why we're trying to achieve all these things. Um, and so this is really roughly the scheme that we've come up with. There is a, a north terrace, a terrace and a south terrace and a, and, and a storage building and the parking is at the top and there is a shared village green in the middle of the building which actually the village doesn't have a green really at the moment. Um, it doesn't really have a centre. The, the, the centre of Hook Norton is dominated by um, uh, the, uh, the graveyard uh, which is sort of uh, not brilliant but you know I understand that's traditionally how it was. So you know the idea of creating a new green square for the community I think was really important and then you'll see that sort of hockey stick kind of building at the bottom um, is is the community building uh, which which I know will provide some interesting facilities it's got um, two single bed sort of mace two little one bed overnight units if you like for people so if you're someone's coming to stay or to stay at your house you can rent this room which will have a little tea prep area and, a, and an ensuite and a little place to sit so that you don't have to have an extra bedroom in your house that you're heating and servicing 360 days a year for people to stay in five days a year so that's something that really grew out of the community we're also looking at a, at a cafe and workshop space you know flexible workspace um, so this is uh, the buildings have gone through a slight change but they very much still look like this but this is the kind of the the, the look of the buildings they're terraces uh, they've got lots of solar panels because we're working with the low carbon hub um to to try and get the buildings uh passive plus so that they're, they're not only passive houses but they're energy positive and you can see the idea of this high quality landscape community area that will be looked after by the community land trust and the money generated from the cafe and the rental spaces um, and the buildings have uh, little roof terraces. There's a first floor two bedroom flat and a ground floor two bedroom flat. Um, and you've got little outdoor spaces on the south looking over the terrace that looks down onto the community to community space. Um, and the flats, you know, uh, have actually altered since this, but they're one and a half bedroom flats, you know, very modern layout. You can see kitchen, living, dining, running through to um, bathroom and bedroom. And, and the idea being that they're homes for life so that they can very easily be adapted for wheelchair use and, and long term occupation, uh, which was very important to us and the community. Um, and, and this is kind of the way that the buildings uh, look, you know, there is a certain industrial look to them, um, but there is an industrial heritage to Hook Norton. Um, Hook Norton had three iron smelters until the 1950s. It's got that's why the brewery is here and the brewery has a sort of verticality, a sort of tallness and sort of density to it that we were sort of looking at. Um, and actually the center of Hook Norton is quite dense. It isn't this low density sort of um, more uh, arts and craftsy kind of layout that many of the new developers go for. It's something a bit different and actually a bit more urban. And so we really wanted to try and reflect that. Um, and this is the, the second, and, and the, the, sorry, the North Terrace uh, is, is for, for uh, market unit and four four units and the south terrace which you can see here is three is two three bed units and two one bed uh units all affordable and some uh market uh sort of 60 percent of market rate um so there's four units that are 60 percent of market rate 
four, uh, three units that are 60% of market rate as a minimum, but we want to do more, five units that are 80% of market rate, and then four that will be sold um, at market rate, but the ownership of those will still be in the kind of control of the land trust, i.e. you can't just sell it to somebody else for lots of money. There's, a, there's an element of control to ensure that the value and the people that move in stay within the kind of ambitions of the, of the land trust. And on the left there, you can see the community uh, building. Uh, these are the flats on the, on, on the South Terrace. Uh, it's, it's a slightly simpler thing with South. So we've got North face, we've got South facing solar array, East facing solar array and West facing solar array so that we're generating uh, all the time or on the site. And we're actually gonna have a microgrid with the sports and social club, which is the sports center I mentioned next door, which has got a 50 kilowatt array. And we're gonna have combined battery and a microgrid using the power from those. Um, this is the community building, uh, which will have a cafe, the, these two one bedroom sort of rental, little rental units uh, for people who live in the, in the, in the, in the development. And we're also, although don't tell Churwell this, and if anyone's uh, on the call from Churwell, uh, close your ears. We're also hoping to be able to rent those when they're not in use for the community to generate a, a small income to help upkeep all of the shared landscape um, and, and for the maintenance. Um, that, that's the plan, but it's a sort of a non-stated plan at the moment because Churwell was sort of not, again, not really up for that at the time. I suspect their, their, ambition, their, their attitudes might change as they see the project come forward. And you can see this is this, is this multi-purpose space, um, which Hook Norton has got a, a lot of community spaces, but they're all quite cold, drafty and large. And this one, the idea is it's highly insulated, passive standard, and um, so very easy to heat up and smaller and more intimate. So you could have a book group for sort of eight in there Whereas at the moment, all of the, the building, you know, if you had a group of eight sat in the buildings that we've currently got, it feels a bit lost and a bit, you know, like you're playing a piccolo in a, in, in a cathedral or whatever. It doesn't feel quite right. There is also a desire and a, and, a, and a want for a community cafe that came very much out of the consultation process. So we're really hoping that we will get a local uh, sort of not-for-profit sort of uh, cafe sort of outfit to take it up. Um, and, and not for profit, actually, probably not the right word, not for dividend, I think is the, is the, is the right word. So that, you know, somebody has to get paid to work there and that's great, but that there are, there is a rental out of that, which helps support the building. And actually on the, the other part of that, we're looking to have, um, workshops and or shared desk space. So again, it's a flexible workspace for people to use. We also have explored the idea of a, of a laundry. But actually, I think the demand for that is relatively lower. So um, we're, sort of that can be explored. But really, the key thing around this building is it's a very simple timber frame, as you can see expressed there, which is ultimately incredibly flexible. The, the walls inside do not hold it up. So you can change the use of the spaces as and when you want to. Um, uh, there you can see the building. So there's the community cafe and the support space in there, a covered sort of terrace area with a lovely tree at the back. A library of things is very much came out of the conversation. So this is a place where you can have a strimmer and a leaf blower and a gazebo that people donate to the library of things and you become a member of the library of things and you borrow stuff. So rather than there being 20 gazebos in the village of which 10 just sit there molding, there might be half as many or, and, and five really good ones. You know, it's a they, these things are very successful in, in, in other communities. And so we wanted to provide a place for that to come. But I think what's important is we're not being, you know, dogmatic about it. It's like, we'll provide a place, we've identified people who are interested in running it and we'll see how it goes. And if it doesn't work, that's a really valuable space we can flex and use. And then there's a workshop studio space at the end for rent and obviously covered bike space, et cetera. So this is how that building looks. It sort of bends around, it's much lower and it mediates itself to the, to the neighbors. It's much, much lower, so it doesn't impact on the neighbors. So behind all of the architecture, there's a sort of sustainability concept, which is around uh, having composting and greenhouses on the site, which are actually um, at this top end of, the, of, of that building there. Greenhouses, composting, tool store, for, and there's growing beds on the, on the wider landscape uh, for, for people that live there. Um, there's also, we have an electric car club in, we have a car club in Hook Norton and we're growing the car club. There will be places for the car, cars to be charged within the community. So off the solar panels that we're, we've got on the site. 
uh, and then there'll be a microgrid. And obviously, we're trying to do a hell of a, you know, a lot with the landscape and to encourage biodiversity um, and, and make that a really kind of welcoming place uh, for, the, for, the, for, the, uh, for local wildlife. Because we are very aware that, you know, in a way, there is a little bit of a hub of, 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 of wilderness that we're sort of building on, which is, you know, sad. But equally, at the same time, uh, we are in conversation to landowners around the village to sort of offset that landscape with other areas of biodiversity and wilderness to sort of, you know, so that we take some, but we give some back. Uh, and I've actually planted about an acre and a half of, of, of scrub and wildflower. So I think I, I'm probably doing the offsetting alone, but I think we're going to use it as a bit of a flag to try and draw people you know, once we start building and we lose that landscape, we will start drawing and people see stuff going up. We can draw landscape uh, landowners in to try and give us little pocket, pocket, not parks, but pocket little reserves, if we like, in the corners of the field. So hopefully that will work well as well. And then heating wise, there is a single heat pump that heats each terrace. So rather than each flat having a heat pump as traditionally, there'll be one small heat pump per terrace because the demands are so low. So we're using, uh, the buildings are designed using something called the Passive House Principles, which are uh, very high levels of insulation, air tightness, uh, mechanical ventilation, heat recovery. And um, they, uh, they, they, they meet those requirements. Um, and what's more is that because of the solar, solar um, gain, uh, so the solar PV on the site, we're actually net exporters of electricity from, from the site. Um, so 40, 60, 200 kilowatt hours per annum, we, we estimate from the sort of base load of the building. So they're, they're, they are what they call passive plus, which is, which is, which is, oh, sorry. Um, oh, I've lost you, I do apologize. Right, here we go. Um, so, so, you know, the buildings are incredibly low energy in construction, but one of the key things that we need to, to we wanted to tackle as well is the idea of embodied energy. So buildings need to be low energy, both in occupation and operation, but also when you get a very high performance building, the, um, the embodied energy becomes much more significant as this graph sort of shows, you know, when you're, you've got a wasteful building over its life cycle, I've realized I'm spelling embodied wrong, I do apologize. Um, when you uh, in operate, you know, when you do a life cycle analysis, the embodied energy is a much smaller part of it when you've got a wasteful building. But once you get a really energy and efficient building, the 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 um, the energy in construction becomes really important. So that's the CO two emitted in building the concrete and the steel and the plasterboard and the copper cabling and the barbs and all of that stuff. So we actually did as a part of this project, we did an analysis to understand what our embodied energy would be. And so we just said, right, let's just assume we build these buildings absolutely standard, still using what is nominally a sustainable approach, which is timber I-beams, which are an engineered timber product, which are very efficient, both in terms of strength, but also in terms of the, the amount of wood they use. And also we blew in uh, wood fiber for the insulation. Again, very low, um, very low embodied energy there. So you know, those things are, are written in, but even so, we were at um, 482 kilograms CO2 per meter squared for construction, um, which is 628 tons, which is really a lot. Um, and now that is without doing any mitigation whatsoever. So we then looked at where does that energy go? And you start seeing, well, the, a big one, a massive one, the biggest one is the PVs, which is really interesting. And there's a whole conversation around PV production and use and if it's worth it or not i am personally i i'm i'm on the side that if you can use the energy locally in electric cars and transportation um then it is definitely I, I believe it is worth doing it's my take on it um other people might disagree that's a huge debate but big stuff like you know if we put air, air, air source heat pumps in every single building there was a huge you know huge um energy use in that um, structural steel because we were just using virgin steel products for, without, throughout the building. And so we started to target these issues. So for example, we will look, use recycled steel for the identified a source for that. Um, what happens if we change all the sanitary wear, all these different little elements, we went through the scheme. And this is not changing it enormously, 
actually this first effort, uh, this is actually where we got to, sorry. So by looking at local supply um, and changing like for like materials for low energy options, but just a lot more work around specification. Um, so for example, we looked at steel bars because you know they last very well and what have you. Uh, and actually acrylic bars now are very good, but the energy difference in creating a steel and an acrylic bath is vast. A steel bath takes so much more energy than an acrylic bath that we lost something like seven tons just by changing uh, the, those, uh, those bathtubs. So, you know, we went through everything line by line and managed to get down to below 294 tons, um, uh, 294 kilograms, which is the um, target for 2030 for uh, Reba. And I have to say, it is difficult. You know, in order for us to really tackle low energy buildings, both in use and construction, it is hard. Certainly at the moment, it is very hard. Um, so we, we kind of managed to drive the things down and get the buildings to a really kind of reasonable way. And we saved 165 tons of CO2. So that, that was sort of the design ex exercise. Uh, we, we have since then, we have done, we had some costings, we had a development model and actually we've been working on our development model and we've needed to find some quite significant savings because uh, the pandemic hit and funding outlooks seem to change quite heavily and funding options seem to change quite heavily. Uh, we seem to have lost quite a lot of options for European funding. Um, so we now have been through a redesign process of simplifying the construction, still providing the same number of accommodation to pretty much the same standard. Uh, one of the things we had was all the houses were lifetime homes throughout the site. And actually what happened was we had to have these things called easy stairs, which meant that the buildings had to be over three stories. By getting rid of these easy stairs, we could get them onto two stories and we could drive out, um, I think 300,000 pounds, 400,000 pounds worth of cost. The ground floors are still lifetime homes, but the, top, the first floors are inside, but they don't quite have, they still have a very good stair, but not quite the standard. So we are still looking at ways of changing the funding. Uh, we had a bit of a hit uh, on uh, the piling situation, the foundations. We'd assumed that we could have a reasonably simple deep pile, but actually a deep trench, but it turned out we need piles because of historic tree growth on the site. I mean, kind of the normal stuff that developers and builders build with, but when you're trying to deliver very low energy housing at high quality for the kind of rents that you're allowed to charge, it is really hard. And one of the really difficult things around that is that we will be charging, we are capped on the rent that we can charge, but there is no control over how much energy it actually takes to heat or live those houses. So it's not affordable living, it is affordable rent. And that is really problematic for us because their running costs are gonna be incredibly low. We would like to offset by charging a little bit more rent to allow us to build to a better standard, which needs a little bit more investment. But at the moment, there is a sort of disconnect between running cost and, and rental cost, which is causing us a sort of problem. The other thing that we're very keen to explore is how we actually construct these buildings so that the local people, local people can, local firms can build it, smaller firms can tend to build elements of it so that that money, that local spend doesn't go down the, the M40 in a white van or, or people don't drive 50, 60 miles there and back it every day to build a building. Because one of the things that I, I know on some projects, the transport costs of the workforce become, uh, carbon emissions of the workforce become one of the largest elements of the emissions of the construction process. So we need to deal with that. So we're looking at, at how to build. Um, and these are the problems we're tackling. It's not easy. Is it going to be built? I'm pretty confident that it will, but these projects don't be under any illusion. These projects are really difficult, really complicated, really hard to get the stars to align, really hard to get the, the, the costs to align. And actually, if you want to know more, go to www.hooknortonclt.org.uk. Um, I think I'm sort of, yes, I, I've, I've, I've said as much as I think I possibly can, or probably as much as anyone wants to hear in their lifetime. So there we go. Charlie, I, th I think you've inspired a whole load of questions on 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 it. So there's, there's loads more, I think, that people want to hear. That was really, really, really good. Thank you for that. Um, I know a couple of, couple of participants have raised their hands. There were just a couple of questions in the chat that I think it might be worth picking up first. 
Uh, one, I think probably a relatively easy one from Chris, which was the type of the tree that is actually in the public spaces and on the green. I think is curious on that. Uh, and there's also one from Jill asking about whether the, um, the housing would be passive house certified after construction, or is that something that, again, is sort of allied to the whole problem of making sure the build quality fits with your uh, affordability of rent? So maybe if you start with those two, and then I'll let um, the, the raised hands people have their, have their say. The, I, I, I'm going to be absolutely honest with you. I have, we did the landscape scheme uh, about a year and a half ago, and I've forgotten exactly what tree it is. Uh, it is in the planning documents that are on the, the Cherwell website. I do know that they are all native species. Uh, everything on the site is native species. There are, we're going to get uh, apple trees. Uh, as you enter into the site, there are apple trees. And then there's kind of wildlife rich planting, dense sort of perennial planting, and then a few trees. And I can't, I think one of them was a field maple. Uh, the main tree, I think possibly was a field maple. In terms of certification, it's a really good question. We've done all the, we're working with possibly the best pa passive house kind of services engineers that, that we know. And they are, um, they are, they, they, they're, they're kind of, overseeing all the details and uh, and all of the uh, modeling so that we know that we 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 comply in terms of modeling and then we will uh, look through construction to try and ensure that you know that in construction will be there and we will get the air tests that make sure that we're at point 6 whether we actually get the swimming badge uh, and actually do the full certification i think is a mute question and not decided because there are significant costs associated with that uh, and um, I know for a house, it's normally three or four thousand pounds. For the flats, it's probably a bit less, but we're probably looking at twelve to fifteen thousand pounds for certification. I might be wrong, but it's we haven't even got to that point yet. And there has been a, a general acceptance that, providing that we are comfortable and confident that we are hitting passive house, we don't necessarily need the swimming badge given those costs. We'd rather spend that money on other things. I think. Brilliant. Thank you, um, Ian. I'm going to ask you to unmute so that you can ask your question. And then there's one from Andy Crawford and one from Jill. So we'll do Ian first in, in that order, if that's okay. Ian? That's not working. I think just hold, hold for a second there, Tom. I think he's... He... Ian, are you there? Can you tell me... I, oh. I think I, you're there. we can hear you now, Ian. Right, okay. Ah. Right. Um, it can't tell me I was unmuted, but there we go. Thank you, Charlie, for that inspiring talk. Um, I, I, I'm, I, my question is, have you any ideas about how we could tackle the existing housing stock in the UK, which is in very poor, sustainable form. Have, can we, how can we tackle that in the sustainable fashion that you have brought to the great work you've done in Hoop Norton? Well, I mean, we, we, we have tried to tackle that with Hook Norton, uh, low carbon uh, hook not low carbon uh, we, we were lending people money at low to zero interest to allow them to do sustainable upgrades uh, the problem is that the payback on 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 whole house retrofit is is long it's almost generational it's 50 years 30 40 50 years i think there's two things there that we need to be very have very much front and center of our minds one is that there is clearly a saving um a saving in terms of if you get a low energy building, you're not using energy to, to heat it, which is clearly crucial given the, the cl climate change and the, CO2 and the current energy, in, in the carbon intensity of the energy system. But secondly, um, health. A lot of the housing stock is not only leaky and unsustainable from an energy performance perspective, it's also unhealthy, damp, cold, and that leads to massive societal costs. Um, interestingly enough, they, there was a, some statistics that said they reckon the poor housing in Wales costs their economy about a billion pounds a year. And that's through um, uh, illness, absenteeism, depression, um, and sort of people being suboptimal. And so it is real money for the economy uh, in any country 
uh, by by doing a whole house retrofit program in a country which has the NHS. It's sort of a no brainer. It's like it's almost stupid that we are not tackling it. Now, the government tried to tackle it with the with the Green Homes deal grants. And we know what happened there. And, 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 and I think uh, they have a lot of work to do and have been really stunningly poor in trying to tackle the, the existing housing stock. In Germany, there's been a 20 year, 15 year uh, program of investing. Even back, I think like 10, 12 years ago, they were doing 8 billion euros a year into their existing housing stock, pre-74 housing stock. We need to do a similar ambitious program here. But equally, I think there needs to be sticks. And, you know, we are all getting very wealthy on our house prices. Um, and the government is very happy to stimulate the market like crazy with stamp duty holidays and da 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 da. But what we need to be doing with our houses is what we've done with our cars, which is if you have a gas guzzling car, you pay more tax. If you have a gas guzzling house, you should pay more council tax. You should be taxed for having an inefficient house. And then you should be supported to make it less inefficient. Until we actually give a crap about this issue, we are not going to deal with it by just sort of making announcements behind a lectern. And it drives me insane when you hear the government saying carbon neutral by 2038 or seven, you know, and they don't have a flipping clue how they're going to do it. So, yes, we can do it, but it needs a complete full court press to achieve it. And other countries are doing good work in it. Uh, so that's a bit ranty, but I think you get the point, you know. We need to spend 30 to 40,000 pounds a house. That's basically what we need to do. And that cost will come down when we're doing 20 million houses. That's really helpful. Thank you. I, I, I think the rant is good, Charlie, because I think there's a whole load of pent up frustration, <laughs> certainly amongst the chat and, and the audience here. We, we've, we've already overrun. So I'm going to let Andrew Crawford have his question. Um, depending on how quick it is, we may have time for Jill as well. But Andy has a council hat as well so i think his input would be quite interesting into this um so i was going to try i was going to try and keep that quiet tom um, <laughs> i guess but my question was council related I, i'm a council on the veil by the way charlie absolutely fantastic great presentation what i'm in interested in this was land that was owned by charwood district council um from what you've said I, I mean, i'm intrigued as to how you managed to negotiate with them <clears throat> given that they're required um, to get best value for any of their assets, and given that no doubt they're under quite a lot of financial pressure, uh, how you manage to negotiate the, the acquisition of the land um, in, in a way that Gerbil were happy with? Well, yeah, best value is really interesting. Um, they, they gave a red book valuation uh, to begin with that was, I, I, I can't quite remember, but half a million quid, 600 grand. But what it totally failed to uh, recognise to begin with was that Taylor Wimpy were going to get them with a ransom strip for probably a third of that at least in order to release the land. Um, but, but, but we could, we had negotiated with Taylor Wimpy that it would be at, at no cost given the fact we could, um, that it was a community led project. So that's why I said you're a fair play to Taylor Wimpy in that case. Um, equally, you know, count from my understanding is that councils can it, best val value is not just financial um that there are other value you know triple bottom line whatever you, i mean i don't really know the full terms i'm sure you know but basically we were able to show them that there were other values to the scheme and effectively they are giving us the land and they are getting eight affordable houses for no cost do you know what i mean so actually they are it is in many ways win-win for them um, because it's really tight to make it stack up. Um, so I, I think, you know, and, and, and Cherwell are a very forward thinking council uh, and they have been really proactive at Graven Hill. They've been really proactive with their own self build programs as well. And they understand that they need to be more proactive and that best value is not just financial. I think that's absolutely true. Working them with them, has not been without challenges because you get a very asymmetric distribution of people's ambitions uh, and, and sort of belief in these kind of projects. And people become very siloed, as you well know, in councils where this is my patch and that all I care about is this patch, even if it's to the detriment of multiple other patches. So Cherwell have been incredible uh, and there have been difficulties, but as you would expect in a complex organization. That's really, really good. Thank you. 
Um, I think I've got to call a halt there. Nina, do you want to uh, just close? But yeah. um, thank you. I'm just going to say a big thank you to Charlie. I mean, that was so amazing, the story of what a local community can do when they, you know, have somebody with a bit of knowledge and a lot of volunteers. It sounded like a, a huge effort went into that. Oh, and, yeah, and thanks it, very much for coming and talking to us, giving up your time on a Saturday. Yeah, and I just quickly want to say that it, it is a complete community effort. I am like, there are people who have put more, as, more into it, you know, as much and more into it than I have in the community. Uh, Tim Linnell, Kathy, loads of people. The Community Land Trust Board have been incredible with their time community coming to the meetings and I think that's the point is that when there is a good news fair thing people rally around and they will fight for it and I think that's what we all need to, to I think it's very easy to lose and feel like we're up against this massive system but actually you know people are good if you give them they a are. chance to be good we are. <laughs> they will be good as you guys know I mean what you've done is amazing okay thank you so um we'll put a link we're showing a Hook Milton housing video in the breaks We'll put a link and stuff on our website so if anyone wants to follow up more there will be more information but yeah thank you so much charlie that was really really good and i need to step aside and let mike blanche tell us about we said thank you